welcome to Impact Church. For service times, upcoming events, and video podcasts, please visit our website, www.impactchurchohio.com. Anyway, it's my privilege to introduce today the speaker, uh, Wes Withrow. We're going through the series, Six Ways to Ruin Your Life. And here's something that hopefully you've picked up from uh, Impact Church, if you've been here or, or just from the environment. We really believe that God has our best in mind, that God wants us to succeed. God wants us to have a, a healthy, a prosperous life. And part of uh, Christ dying on the cross was to defeat some of those things that keep us in, in bondage and in shackles. And so as you go through the book of Proverbs, there are these big topics, these big themes that keep reoccurring. And if we would just listen to the, the wisdom of Proverbs, uh, the wisdom of God in that sense, man, so many of us would be a lot better off. It, it's not an issue of what we can do for God. It's not an issue of um, following all the letters of the law as much as sometimes just practical um, applications and principles that are already in Scripture and just applying those to our life. There are certain things in Scripture that are true regardless of whether people will follow Jesus or don't. I mean, if you uh, if you take a lot of interest and you're borrowing money left and right, you're going to end up in, in, in poverty, right? The, the Bible says that the servant is, or the uh, borrower is servant, to the lender. That's true whether you follow Jesus. That's true whether you go to church. That's true regardless. You could, you know, worship Satan. If you take out a lot of interest, you're still going to be in debt. Your finances are still going to be messed up at the end of the day. And so part of the heart of this series is looking at some of those big pictures that Proverbs talks about and seeing if we can't sort of head those off at the paths and uh, instead of ruining our lives, not ruin them. So with that, I'll introduce Wes and uh, it's my pleasure to have him speak today. Can you tell Ryan's getting this uh, pastor thing down? He's starting to like, oh, I'm not speaking today, but I still have to preach today. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought that was funny. <laughs> but he's right. Um, we have, um, well... We're talking about emotions today, and one of the things that make me happy is when I have new technological things to play with and get to try them out, but what makes me not so happy is when I don't do it right in front of everybody. Um, let's see. There we go. All right. Um, and so, anyway, as, as Ryan was saying, we're talking about uh, this series, Six Ways to Run a Life, and we've got... Um, uh, and we've uh, established some of these things of like, how do you want to run your life is uh, by not, or acting like uh, there is no God, or uh, walking with fools, because that turns you into a fool, and foolish things usually have bad consequences, and that kind of stuff, and and um, today we're going to be talking about emotions, as I said, and uh, and w one way, uh, one of our six ways, not an exhaustive list by any means, is uh, not uh, controlling your emotions or letting your emotions control you. And and uh, so uh, that's where we're going today. And we have, uh, well, my kids have, I should say, have uh, this new movie, Inside Out. Have you seen that? Uh I kind of think that it's more for us than for the kids on this one. There's been a few Pixar films that are like that. And and I know I'm using kids' stuff for illustrations again. That's what I do. Um, but, but I was thinking, you know, like, these aren't all the different emotions, but they use some of them. And I saw somewhere where they considered it, but it would have been like a mob in this little girl's head. Uh, do you guys know? Some of you might not know what the movie's about. I guess I'll, I'll fill you in a little bit. Uh, essentially, they've personified these different emotions, as you can see pictured up here, um, uh, within this little girl's head, and it starts out from when she's born, and the first emotion is joy and, and all of that. And so you have these different ones inside of her head, and it's, if I actually am saying it out loud, it sounds kind of trippy, but... <laughs> 
like she's schizophrenic, or I guess that's different than multiple personality disorder. But anyway, that's what you have going on up there, and and uh, it, it's fun to watch and see, and and I enjoy it even if my kids aren't as into it. But I was wondering if we couldn't get some uh, participation. What are some things uh, that make you feel sad? And you can just shout them out. I know we don't usually do that, but death in the family. I can give you a, an illustration I have. It's kind of silly, um, but it, it makes me cry almost every time. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's this. You'll know. <laughs> I have this theory that these dogs and these cats are actually fine by the time they film this commercial because they've already rescued them. You know, they've fed them, they've taken care of them, they've groomed them, all that kind of stuff. And so they needed them to look sad for the commercial, so they put on some Sarah McLaughlin music to get them in the right mood. <laughs> and so that dog, he wasn't actually limping, he just was crying so hard he couldn't hold himself up. But she's, it's like, I don't know. You know, women like, well, some women like Lifetime movies because it makes them cry. I don't like Sarah McLaughlin because of that. So what about like anger, disgust, fear, joy? What are some things that make you feel these kind of things? Driving? Driving? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a good time to have like a sticker in your back window. So every time you start to say something or do something, I won't give you any ideas. Um, yeah, to remember. That's how I got out of it. I had a church sticker in the back window, and I'm like, oh, I shouldn't do that. Um, bad witness. What's that? Yeah. So uh, you're supposed to give me a little more here. <laughs> Your kids? Yes. Yes. Jobs, and kids. I gotta, I gotta say the kids thing. They, I don't think I've ever felt every single emotion you can think of all at the same time so intensely until we had kids. They bring every single one of them out. <laughs> it's like, how can I love you and want to throw you so badly at the same time? I don't know. Not playing the Powerball. <laughs> Oh, not winning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was actually thinking about, like, if I were a Cincinnati fan, you know how angry I would be that the Steelers basically won? Because <laughs> I know. <laughs> and they're still angry. They should have had more self-control. That's the whole sermon right there. <laughs> but... So, I mean, all, all of these things, you know, you're scared to death of what might happen when your kids, you drop them off at school for the first time. You're, uh, you have incredible joy whenever, uh, which joy is one of those hard things, right? It's, it, there's so many different elements to it, uh, to joy. It's like it, it, there's, it gives you hope. It might give you contentment. It challenges you all at the same time, just this one emotion. It, it, it made me think of, I, I'm using commercials a lot today, but it, it made me think of uh, when LeBron uh, wrote that letter saying he's coming back. I know I'm not originally from Cleveland, but I'm assuming that at least some people probably had some like, forget you, stay away. But I think most people had this, you know, when they saw that Nike commercial, do you remember that one? where he was, when he first got back, is like right before uh, the start of the season, and, and he, they're going in, and he's, he's talking about, like, we got to win this for Cleveland, and, and all of that kind of stuff. And then it ends where, well, it ends like this. I love ball one, ball three. So I think that maybe we, we uh, experience all sorts of complicated emotions uh, with when we maybe see something like that. And I was looking on Wikipedia because it's, you know, the best place for all your sources. And, um, and, and I came across this article uh, 
that had a number of things. In it was this one guy, he actually started this, uh, or created this kind of a chart for all the different emotions, at least that he had. And we see... <laughs> We see a number of them, and, and I think we can probably think of how we felt every one of those at one time or another. You know, it's not just anger, but sometimes it's rage. And, uh, you know, we were watching um, uh, this Netflix documentary, uh, Making of a Murderer. Have you guys seen that? And the first episode, I was so bored. Like, I don't know why people like it so much. I don't care. But then Sarah kept watching it on her own, and she's telling me about the one kid who's, uh, he's definitely special needs, and he, he definitely um, didn't understand what the police officers were, were saying to him or getting out of him and what the consequences were and, and, and that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, and that hits a little too close that someone might be able, be able to manipulate him like that. And even now, so I think about it, I'm just getting angry. And I think it's going, there's some parts where it's like it gets beyond. Think about anger and <laughs> like how dare you do that. And, and, and so you, you, you feel those different things and, and you look at that huge wheel of, uh, of all, like how dare you do that. And that huge wheel of, uh, of all the different. I saw that was actually part of, um, uh, part of the article. Uh, and, and it was where, where they say emotions are complex. And, and you read what it said after that. This is one theory of how emotions work that they were giving. And you read that paragraph and you're like, yeah, I think, I think they are complex. <laughs> the physiology of emotion is closely linked to arousal of the nervous system with various states and strengths of arousal relating apparently to particular emotions. Emotion is also linked to behavioral tendency. Now I had to read that a few times, like what are you actually saying? But I think, uh, and I think we can all attest to, uh, essentially uh, when you have these different emotions, it actually brings out physical feelings. You know, like you can, like when I feel that anger, I can feel my heart rate going up. It, it, it has a direct link to our, our physiology. You know, my stomach starts to clench. Uh, even my, sometimes maybe my fists start to clench. And, and then, you know, it's talking about it's linked to our behavioral tendency. Like if I had no self-control whatsoever, it might make me do something stupid like punch a person in the face or, <laughs> or, or throw something at the TV when I'm mad watching that. You know, uh, that sort of stuff, you know, where we have... Uh, we have all these emotions, and that's what it really comes down to, I think, is that by itself, emotions say act now. Would you agree with that? I mean, for the most part, if we feel something and we want, we just, emotions on their own say act now. And in this series that we're going through, taking a look at Proverbs and, 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 and the different things that it says, it's almost... Sometimes when you read through Proverbs, it has kind of this, like, disconnected feel at times. It's, but it, it's kind of like, imagine your grandpa, you're hanging out with your grandpa or your grandma, and, they're, and they've lived all these years, and they've experienced all these things, both uh, great triumphs and hor horrible tragedies and, and, uh, and all the in-betweens and that kind of stuff. And, and you're... And they, they know that they're not going to be around much longer, but they want to, like, give you their wisdom, their observations, their things that they've learned because they don't want you to learn the hard way. They want your life to be better. And Proverbs is kind of like that. It's basically like this, this grandpa telling, telling his grandkids, you know, things that he's learned. And it's, so it's, these, it's usually these big general statements. And that we can learn from and that we can understand. And so uh, looking at this idea of emotions and this idea of it telling us to act now, he's, uh, we're going to look at a few where it, it, it talks about how, what the consequences are if we just act right now. And so if you want, you can grab the Bibles in front of you and follow along, or you can just follow on the screen. Um, it's page 349 in those Bibles, but Proverbs chapter 21, 
uh, and starting in verse 16, it says, One who wanders from the way of good sense will rest in the assembly of the dead. So much more poetic than the way I would say it. If you do dumb stuff, you'll end up dead. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think we can we can all appreciate that, you know what it, it really builds off of what uh, Pastor Ryan talked about last week. Uh, you know when you're hanging out with fools, you do foolish things, you have bad consequences, right? And and so we see a few more. Like if we go on to the next verse, whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. And and if we just follow, which usually that goes hand in hand, I think, if we just follow after the pleasures of our life, uh, if we're allowing our emotions to take us there, uh, then we find ways to lose everything. You know, in this case, there's, I think we all could uh, name someone who's, who spent all their money on alcohol or got you know, lost their job, lost their family, and all of that kind of stuff because they love the pleasure more. And this one, I just had to include because it kind of makes me laugh when I first read it. But I'm also like, what has that got to do with it? It's just one more verse down. And he's like, it is better to live in a desert land than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. And, but I think... <laughs> I think I had to stop and think about it. What, what, what is it he actually saying? And I think we are, and this probably comes from my, uh, my time with college students so, and seeing what drove them uh, quite often, you know, is that uh, you, could, uh, you could think someone was really hot and you don't notice all the other bad characteristics, uh, and so you. But then once you're in that, with your you're with that person that causes nothing but drama. You suddenly realize it would be better to live in a desert without any food and water, than with someone who causes this kind of drama all the time. I know uh, when Sarah first started a, a job. That first year, there were some people, a couple people in her department that uh, it seemed like that's all they did. Even when there was nothing to complain about, nothing to start, they were, everything was fine, they would create stuff to have drama about. And, and so I think that's who it's talking about, and I think it works both ways. Uh, I don't think it's just, just for you know, women. I think also men can be that way too. And, and it's better for us to, to step back and like, is this person someone I should have gotten in a relationship with or should get, pursue and that kind of stuff? And so, and so these first three verses that we're looking at is that what, what's, the, what's the consequences of, of allowing emotions to make us just act now? And then, and then these next ones, it, he, he comes to this thing of, of self-control. And of how, what are the positives, the positive consequences to us having self-control. And so the first one is whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. So it starts out with we know <laughs> if we can just stop ourselves from doing dumb things or saying dumb things. And I have to admit a lot of these verses uh, that ended up reading a lot of the scripture, the even ones that I'm not bringing up today, have to talk about the words we use. And that is probably a hard, hard thing for me. Uh, and so I think maybe today I'm speaking to myself as much as anyone else. But the first part of self-control is knowing when not to do stuff, when not to say something. Um, the second part a fitly word spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Once again, all of these proverbs are much more poetic than I am. But uh, essentially knowing when to do the right thing, when to say the right thing, or what the right thing is. Uh, 
And when we can do that, when it, so, so self-control isn't just not saying something, but it's also saying the right thing. And, and when we can do that, it shines. Does that make sense? And then finally, also, it's the right time. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Now, being, um, being a minister... Uh, this might apply to just me and Ryan more, but I think we've all experienced tragedy, and we know people who have experienced tragedy. When you've experienced tragedy and someone comes up to you and gives you, like, this is why it happened, you know, d- even if it's true, doesn't that make you mad? I mean, <laughs> so, and so sometimes, sometimes it's not so much, you know, even when someone asks, like, why did it happen? One of the things when you're going through grief, you always have those questions. Why did this happen? And, but you don't really want the answer. Not in that moment. <laughs> and when someone gives you that answer, it really just makes you angry. And, and so it's knowing when. When to say the right thing. When to do the, do the right thing. And so we have that. We have emotions say act now but self-control steps back assesses a situation then acts accordingly and um, I think it would be easy to stop right there and that's usually where we do okay that's great you should show more self-control but I think I think what we have to understand is that uh, and, and I don't know I'm old enough now, and kind of the culture that I grew up in, being a guy, the only kind of emotion that's really appropriate uh, is the angry kind, you know, or like what you would see on a football field, you know, whatever makes you like <laughs> block that guy a little harder, knock him down, tackle him, you know, if you get pumped up, they always talk about those emotions, but if, uh, but if I were to admit that Sarah McLaughlin makes me cry, that's usually not very manly. And so I really put myself out there. But, <laughs> but those usually aren't the things. And, and, we, and we think about that. It does a couple of things. One, it, it allows us to actually feel what others feel. It, acts as, it, it allows us to have compassion on someone else. That's why you see those kind of commercials like that. Because if it makes you sad enough <laughs> that something is wrong... Uh, that the, that particular animal got abused, it might actually spur you to act. Because while emotions cause us to act now quite often, um, apathy quite often uh, causes us to just do nothing. And, it's, and it helps us, it motivates us, and brings us uh, to action. And so I think, uh, I think emotions are actually a really good thing. And as long as we understand their proper place. And so we see, we see things like, um, uh, well, I don't think this is just pop psychology, you know, just my own opinions. Uh, uh, when you look at the Bible and you look at different characters in the Bible, and I think the central figure of the Bible, you can see that. Have you guys seen uh, this meme on Facebook? If, ever, if anyone ever asks you what would Jesus do, remind them that flipping over tables and chasing people with a whip is within the realm of possibility. I've, I see that. It makes kind of the, the Facebook rounds about every six months for the last four or five years. And it, it, it makes me laugh. It's kind of funny. Um, but at the same time, it's like you think about it. Like Jesus, the Bible tells us that Jesus was without sin. And and we also see from that story, if you were to go look it up and see what happened, is that, is that he got angry. He got, it made him mad when he went into the temple and he saw these, these different merchants taking advantage of people's religion and making money off of it. And it made him angry enough to actually act and flip over their tables and whip them and drive them out of the temple. And if... If, and so I would say that if having anger in any situation is a sin, then Jesus must not have been without sin. And so I think I think having it in the in in the right con there's 
in the right context and having that, in, in his case, there was this holy, this righteous anger um, is actually a right thing and it motivates us past uh, the consequences. Because he, the Pharisees and all these other people were already upset at Jesus. They were already looking for reasons to stop him, to shut him down, to do whatever they had to, because to, people were following him instead of them. And, and so uh, they were already looking for that. And he had made this trip into Jerusalem. And, it, and this, this scene always makes me think of that Braveheart scene, you know, where he's like, I'm going to pick a fight. It's that uh, you see that, like, <laughs> it feels that way. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And it was just, I believe, if I remember right, a day or two after that where they end up arresting him and he ends up getting crucified. And, and those, I think those emotions help us be motivated to do what's right despite the consequences. But I think there's a proper context for it. Now, I don't know how to talk about, these, about the idea of self-control, whether it's emotions or anything, just that having self-control without bringing up um, the fruit of the Spirit, and, which is the Apostle Paul spoke to or wrote to uh, the church in uh, Galatia, Galatia um, in the letter of Galatians. And, and, he, and he lists off all these different things of like th- what you shouldn't do and what basically draws you away. But then after that, he, he lists off the fr- what he calls the fruit of the Spirit. You know, what's the natural things we're going, what, what's going to develop in our character and who we are if we are walking with Christ. And... And so it starts out with, uh, in, in verse 22 of chapter 5, uh, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And then he goes on and he says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. And so uh, we see this argument for this self-control of, of uh, it being a part of who, who, gri- who Christ continues to mold us and make us into. And, and it's all rooted in this idea of what love is. And, and, so, we, uh, and so we have... We have the, these ideas, emotions say act now, self-control assesses a situation and acts accordingly. And finally, I think um, where the natural progression from that is that wisdom finds a healthy outlet for the emotions. The difference, um, like I was saying earlier, what we, <laughs> uh, at least the way I grew up, a lot of you know, things like, it's still awkward to, like, give my dad a hug when we're leaving. <laughs> like, I know my dad loves me, and I have no doubt about that, but it's still, like, almost forced. Like, I have to make myself do it. It's just, you know, different things like that, you know, showing affection, having these different emotions. It's, uh, we tend to, at least the Midwestern males, I think, tend to have this, like, you dam up the emotions inside you, and you don't let them out. But then it usually comes out in really dumb ways. And what I would say is that you find a healthy outlet for it. And, and an example of that, I think, um, it can be a number of different ways. But, but specifically what I'm talking about is that it should draw us to doing something about what that is. So, for example, like we, Sarah and I have been um, gone to a number of and kind of participate in this this group called connecting for kids um, and it's it's something that's just like for parents that have uh, uh, that have kids with special needs and there's just these unique and different ways in which um, uh, uh, it's just different than having typical kids and 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 there's different things that they do that helps resource us that gets you you know uh, 
if you're looking for an occupational therapist, for example, we can call them up and they have a whole list of ones that they would recommend and, and that kind of stuff. Or if you're just looking for other families that they can play together, you know, they have, hey, we need other people that can relate and so on and so forth that, you know, it's just a great resource and, and a great community. And the reason why it started was because um, her name happens to be Sarah, too. Uh, Sarah saw she had kids that had these different special needs, and she's living in, I think, Westlake, and there wasn't anything like that. And you can feel extremely lonely. You can feel um, extremely sad. You, you know, anytime you realize that uh, all these dreams you had for your kid isn't going to come, isn't going to happen, you know, you can, you, all, all the different kinds of emotions can come from that. And instead of letting that keep her down, she started this organization that not only helps herself, but helps all these hundreds and hundreds of other people. And so, you know, you find this, um, I can't look at Sarah now, you find this healthy outlet for the emotions. Sometimes it's not going to be something huge like that, you know, where you're going to start this whole organization, but, but you find something that you can use that and drive you to and make, make this world a little better um, and you would be amazed at how much um, how much better that makes you and how much that actually works as a therapy for you um, and so I think uh, I, I, I get very practical uh, today on, on this stuff and and so I think it really comes down to, with emotion speaking and in, in all these generalities, is that quite often if the emotions are controlling you, it's because you don't have security in the right place and you don't have the right focus. And so I think where, you, where it starts, where it begins, is that you change where you find your security by changing where you focus. And, and so, for example, you know, if... If you lose your job and you don't know where you're going <laughs> where your income's coming from and how you're going to pay your bills, yeah, that's something, you know, there's this let's have a practical real we have to do certain things, but in the end can we uh, can we think clearly? Can we look to okay, what's the next steps we have to do or do we just freak out, ball up and and be overwhelmed and wallow in it? Or do we deal with it? And, and I think the difference is, is do you find your security in money or a job? Or do you find security in, in the one who has made us, created us, uh, sustains us, keeps us? Does that make sense? And I think, I think what it does is that we've, uh, I, I, that's usually a good gut check. If we're starting to be overwhelmed, uh, we've lost focus of the one who has control, which is kind of, uh, which is kind of a weird sort of. It, it sounds like double talk, but I think in order to control our emotions, it starts with letting go of control to the right person. Does that make sense? And. Um, And so finally, uh, with, uh, when we were reading uh, that previous uh, scripture, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, there was one more verse that I hadn't read yet. He says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. I think that sums up everything, what we're talking about tonight, is that essentially the one who's given us life, because that's what Jesus did, right? Jesus didn't just make... Uh, as as the saying goes, didn't just make bad people good. He made dead people alive. And so we are alive when we've given our lives uh, to Christ, when he is our Lord and he's our Savior. We're living by his spirit. We're alive because of him. And so, and, and so Paul is saying, now let us also walk like it. 
Does that make sense? And so I, I think a good way um, for us to kind of apply all of this is that if you have like, I don't if you have a pen and paper or if you like using uh, notes in your smartphone or I tend to stay away from paper, I hate paper, but <laughs> I'm weird. Uh, but whatever, where you can, like right now, find something that you can take, jot down a note of what's, what's something that God is, uh, or that you have let kind of control your life. I mean, it's, it's something that you just, you know for yourself, you can stop and think about that. What is something uh, where, uh, or you can back up and start with if it helps you, if you're just overwhelmed by fear. What is causing that fear? And you can, you can make a note of that or you can think about it later. Um, and then, and then how, how can you change your focus from that? And how can you, uh, how can you um, change the outlet? What, what can make that uh, be a positive where you're going to make your life and other people's lives around you better from it. Does that make sense? I know that's not something that's easy to just write down right now, so I'll let you think. Um, but don't, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I always struggle with when I speak is that this stuff should matter to us here and now in our lives and apply to us right now. And the last thing I want is that we walk away and we don't even remember what we talked about. Even if it was something that felt really good, what was it that actually mattered and how can we, how can we grow from that? And so, and so if, if it helps you to write that down, do that. Um, so, or at least make a note saying, I'll do that later. Um, or, or if it helps, I think we need each other and so tell someone, tell the person you're sitting next to, or I guess some of you aren't sitting next to anybody, but, <laughs> but tell somebody, a friend, you know, what is it and how can it be better? Because there's something about when we use our words and we speak it to someone else that it makes it more real to us rather than just keeping it internalized. And, and so apply this and use this. Um, I know this was more teaching, less emotional, but that's all right. Uh, how about we go ahead and pray? Lord, I thank you. Thank you for uh, who you've made us to be. God, I thank you for all the emotions, the way that uh, we feel for others, the compassion that you give us, the, um, the way uh, these emotions motivate us. Lord, I pray that uh, what we see, though, is, is what motivates you, who do you care about? What do you care about? What do you love? Who do you love? What's important to you? And that we grab a hold of that and it becomes important to us. God, uh, use us and make us um, better. Make us more like you. Continue to mold us. Give us these things like love and self-control. Continue to work that in our lives. Use this community to uh, where we work together, uh, where we build each other up, God. And we thank you for who you are, that you do care about us that much, that you would die for us. Lord, we're, we, we find we are who we are because of who you are and what you've done for us. And we we are grateful for that, God, and we love you and we praise you. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this week's video podcast. To attend one of our actual services, please visit our website for service times and location. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Please return for next week's video podcast.